Hello, everyone, and uh, a good afternoon to Brown & Co's international podcast. A very warm welcome um, to all for this uh, special podcast uh, that seeks to examine the current ag investment markets, commodity markets, within the context that we find ourselves post three weeks of the Ukraine-Russia crisis that we now tragically find ourselves in. Um, my name is Adam Oliver, um, and I'm joined by Charles Whitaker, uh, Brown & Co's managing partner. Charles spends um, some of his time in the UK, some of his time in, in South America and elsewhere. And I'm based in Poland and travel across the region, um, normally to include Russia and Ukraine. So Charles, very good to have you have you join us. Um, we are now three weeks into this conflict that we find ourselves in. Perhaps you might just set the scene as far as where we'd arrived at before the conflict, as far as commodity prices uh, and ag markets in general, and then we can uh, we can go from there. No, thanks for that, Adam. Um... Yeah, I and mean, I think we've we've had a sort of period of the last 12 months where um, global ag commodities have been building in value generally, uh, leaving behind the sort of seven or eight years of fairly dull net farm returns, net farm income returns. I think most farmers, most scale farmers around the world would say, you know, if you look at commodity price graphs, been fairly flat really since 2000 and 2012, 13. Um, and of course, that's been you know upended completely by this you know, disaster position in, in Ukraine with Putin and his madness from Russia, which looks set to have not only caused immense human suffering and um, circa you know, three million refugees and counting, uh, seeking safety and solace somewhere else, but is also going to disrupt substantially the Ukraine's 100 million ton annual production for the 20th season. So, and that, as we all know, has put um, further impetus into into global markets. So I think notwithstanding Ukraine, we already had pressure, um, upward pressure on commodity values because of uh, um, sort of demand side pull really, rather than any supply side shocks. We've obviously now got a supply side shock. But I think that's going to put further, you know, positive into food and farming production around the world and perhaps investment interest will come back to that in a minute but notwithstanding it does cause some quite major disruptions some of which we understand and can see now already and some of which we probably can't quite understand yet in terms of severe cost of production impact in the very short term being fuel and fertilizer i suppose the the major ones which are impacting severely on crop decisions that people are making now and feeding decisions for feeding livestock and particular pigs which in europe western europe certainly are in quite severe trouble um, at a sort of demand price way under cost of production. So yes, I think we haven't quite understood all those impacts yet, um, but perhaps we'll go on to discuss that in a minute. Very good, thank you, thank you. So I think just to touch on the, on the, you know, the Ukraine crisis at this moment in time, as far as, as far as what we're seeing, I think just, just to set the scene and just to remind everyone that of course, Ukraine and Russia together account for circa 30% of global exports of wheat and barley combined. And perhaps even more importantly than that, represents just over half of the global sunflower oil production as far as Ukraine and Russia is concerned. So just, to, just in case anyone was in any doubt, this, this Black Sea region is is pretty critical to global ag commodity production and the export markets in particular. Now, I think what we're seeing, just as far as the, the, the sort of practical reality on the ground, is that you know many many farming companies are, are facing that awful awful decision at this moment in time about whether to plant and and what to plant because. You've obviously got the, the concerns around production being cash and diesel availability and people, um, never mind before we get into seed availability, fertilizer availability and crop protection. But of course, then that rolls forward, doesn't it? As far as, well, where are we going to be at harvest time as far as the same elements, cash availability, 
diesel availability people. And then that rolls forward again, doesn't it, as far as logistics, namely if Russia is controlling rail lines and inland transportation infrastructure, then the risks just multiply from one onto the other. And that's before we get to the market as far as, you know, will, will access to markets be there as far as actually being able to turn that investment and that crop into cash. So, so I think, you know, our, our sentiment goes out not only to the people uh, as far as the humanitarian crisis. I think, you know, what we're seeing is those really, really difficult, substantially difficult decisions being made on the ground at this moment in time which is going to have you know, major impacts, both in terms of production in Ukraine and also in Russia, of course, because many of those credit lines have now dried up in Russia uh, relating to production um, and therefore the knock on effects uh, that that's going to have as far as as far as global trade lines. Um, so that's Ukraine. Yeah. But, but Charles, bring, bring that back for us to, to, to the bigger picture, if you would, as far as, you know, what should we be thinking about going forward relating to ag investments? You know, we, we've had, if we, if we turn for a second to the US, um, what, what's happening there as far as, uh, as far as the markets are concerned and land in particular? Yeah, well, I think, again, even before this last four weeks, I think we've seen a building of net farm income and where markets follow net farm income in terms of land values, which they certainly do in the US, we've seen a building of land values, I think even we're seeing that in the in the UK and have seen that for a few months as well. And I think that's been brought on by a number of factors. One, we've got better better returns from agriculture from you know commodity prices coming off the bottom, really, where they've been for the last six or seven years. And if you look at manufacturers demand for, you know, whether it be uh, ADCO or, or DEER uh, and the sort of six to 12 months waiting lists for those products, that, that tells a story as well in terms of agriculture back making some money, people are reinvesting where they haven't been able to do so. But I think much more fundamentally, you've also got both private capital and institutional capital, pension funds, life funds, etc., chasing uh, non-correlated returns from equities and other sort of more liquid markets, and the real asset markets in particular as an inflation hedge. We've now, you know, got inflation moving strongly in in the West generally, both in the UK and and in the US and Western economies in general. That obviously is going to be spiked further, much more significantly by the Russian. Ukraine disaster, um, but that also we think will drive will drive money to find land as a sensible place to put part of uh, investment portfolios. Really, particularly as we're now getting more attractive returns. That all that said, as Adam has just just alluded to, the cash flow impact and resource required for funding fuel and fertilizer, particularly, which are now something like three times their value of six months ago. Um, is very, very significant. And, and so it's not all a walk in the park, as, as, as it were. But I think the fundamentals of agriculture, global food supply, food security as a regional or a country strategy have changed fundamentally, resulting from Putin, really. Um, and that's something that you know, all of us involved in agricultural production and investment are going to no doubt be working hard to seek to um, alleviate to an extent in terms of our, our own investment and production plans around the world. And we, we see positive uh, out of all that really in terms of agriculture, you know, leaning in to come back to us a full production effort and perhaps a little bit less environmental effort in some economies that have been fully focused on environmental protection, perhaps and less focused on production because there's a global food security problem coming up. So a return to fundamentals, a return to fundamental food production and food security being key here? I think so, but with the advantage 10 years on or 20 years on or even 50 years on, if you want to go back that far, of precision farming, you know, the capability now of uh, data and providing, you know, broad acre prescriptions over vast areas of land subject to climate and other impacts, obviously, on a much more, much bigger bigger scale. And so I think, you know, we're better equipped to handle that that now and to respond to that now. But yes, I do, I do see a, refer, a return to fundamentals, plus this inflow of capital, not just because returns look more attractive, because we need you know, places for capital to um, 
hedge out inflation risk, but also you've got the sort of climate debate um, still very much there as a, as, a, as a driver as well in the future for soil sequestration of, of carbon uh, and agriculture's role in that. So I think, yes, um, the future, I would say, looks positive in terms of how we can um, both respond to perhaps a global food crisis and in turn, turn perhaps attract investment from some of the sort of larger capital sinks which have been in the past prepared to look at US and maybe Australia but not much further. Maybe we can encourage them to look at areas like Latin America which have got you know vast production capability but hitherto um, institutional investors have been generally anyway shying away from. Indeed, indeed. And with that thank you very much Charles. I think uh, that's great. Thank you very much for all that have listened to this. Uh, we must draw this to a close now. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, we'll be in touch. Thank you.